On this week at Enterprise Tech, we have Mr. Curtis Franklin and Mr. Oliver Rist on the show today. Now, remote work is definitely here to stay, and that means organizations need to look beyond VPNs and the traditional antivirus software. We'll definitely talk about some of the trends that are happening there. Plus, we have a great guest. Technology is playing an important role in how NGOs and nonprofits operate and how they serve people who desperately need help. Today, we have Eric Arnold. He's CTO for Microsoft Philanthropies. We're going to talk about the technology that's being used there and how things have actually evolved over the years. Lots to talk about. You definitely should not miss it. Twilight on the set. Podcasts you love. From people you trust. This is Twit. This is Twyatt, This Week in Enterprise Tech, episode 483, recorded March 4th, 2022. The Philanthropic Microsoft. This episode of This Week in Enterprise Tech is brought to you by New Relic. That next 9 p.m. call is just waiting to happen. Get New Relic before it does. And you can get access to the whole New Relic platform and 100 gigabytes of data free per month forever. No credit card required. Sign up at newrelic.com slash enterprise. And by Nareva. Traditional audio conferencing systems can entail lots of components. Installation can take days. And you might not get the mic coverage you need. That's complex expensive. But Nareva Audio is easy to install and manage. No technicians required. And you get true full room coverage. That's easy economical. Learn more at nareva.com. And by FlexTrack, the purple teaming platform. Save time and increase productivity with the premier cybersecurity reporting and workflow management product designed to support proactive security strategy from assessment through remediation. Visit plextrack.com slash twit to claim your free month. Welcome to Twyatt, this week in enterprise tech, the show that is dedicated to you, the enterprise professional, the IT pro, and the geek who just wants to know how this world is connected. I'm your host, Louis Moreski, your guide through this big world of the enterprise, but I definitely can't guide you by myself. I need to bring in the professionals, the experts in their field. And today we have our favorite business tech journalist. He's contributing editor at PC Mag, and he's Mr. Oliver Riss. Oliver, welcome back to the show. How are you doing? I'm doing great. Thank you for having me. Join the nice, cold, gray, clammy weather up here in the Northeast. Indeed. Indeed. Yeah. Welcome to the Northeast, right? You know, at least we've got some sun. I think that's the key. I come from the Pacific Northwest. It's raining there. I think the sun is the key factor here, whether it's cold or not. What do you think? Oh, dude, totally. <laughs> <laughs> having having lived through like four of four of those winters. Yeah, I don't I don't want to go back to those 40 degrees and raining every day for five months straight. Thank you. No. Yep, exactly right. Exactly right. Well, thanks for being here, Oliver. Well, speaking of experts, we also have the man who has the pulse on enterprise and security. He's Mr. Curtis Franken. He's senior analyst at Amdia. Welcome back to the show, Curtis. How are you doing? I am fine, Lou. I'm uh, not cold or or clammy or anything down here. It is sunny and 84 right now in the city, beautiful. And uh, I'm enjoying that because I'm not enjoying certain parts of the business life, as you might guess, with uh, cybersecurity being my beat. We're staying awfully busy trying to keep up with what is going on uh, over in Eastern Europe. Uh, lots of actual ugliness and even more potential right. ugliness uh, to try to stay on top of. So uh, it is uh, keeping everyone in my corner of the industry very busy these days. Indeed, indeed. I agree with that. Well, we won't be getting into that this week. We did cover a little bit last week, but we'll actually probably maybe in a couple of coming show here and there, we'll cover some more of it uh, in the upcoming shows. But today we have a it's a pretty busy week in the enterprise and we have lots to cover. So, you know, we're going to talk a little bit about remote work. It's here to stay. Hybrid work is here to stay. That means organizations are looking beyond the VPNs and antivirus software to help secure the edge of their network. The question is, what's the trends? What are they doing there? So we'll definitely talk about it. Now, technology is playing an important role in how NGOs and nonprofits operate and how they serve people who desperately need help. Today, we have Eric Arnold. He's CTO of Microsoft Philanthropies. We're going to go talk about some of those technologies and just how things have evolved over the years. So stick around. Lots to talk about later on here in Twyatt. But first, like we always do, we have to jump into this week's news blips. Well, folks, it wouldn't be an enterprise week 
without a leak. That's right. The files as part of a data dump appear to stem from a data breach at NetCentral, a Houston-based web service provider that contracts with state law enforcement agencies across the U.S. Now, the data dump, dubbed Blue Leaks, was published by a collective called DDoS Secrets. Many of the documents claim to show how law enforcement agencies have been sharing information about COVID-19 protesters and even tweets critical of the police. Now, a memo, a memo attained by the security reporter Brian Krebs said hackers compromised NetCentral servers and stole files hosted by fusion centers or state agencies that facilitate information sharing among police departments. Now, the leaked files indicate that the FBI and other law enforcement agencies have been keeping close tabs on social media accounts that they believe are organized protesters. Now, one unclassified FBI memo to police document departments in late May said that law enforcement supporters' safety could be in danger, citing two tweets about destroying protest paraphernalia. Now, other internal memos included in the leaks showed police departments exchanging information about specific clothing, signs, and cars of protesters deemed potential threats. Now, police officers have already made arrests after tracking people down using photos taken at protests. However, the documents don't appear to include much information about specific officers' misconduct or complaints about police departments, which are unlikely to be shared among departments via a fusion center. Now, similar to WikiLeaks, DDoS Secret says that it acts as a forum to publish leaked information while keeping the identities of hackers a secret and that it's uninvolved in the exfiltration of the actual data. Well, if nothing else, they're looking glass into what hackers will continue to do in order to exfiltrate data. Well, a new census has found hundreds of open source components that could undermine security. This week, the Linux Foundation and Harvard's Lab for Innovation Science released the rankings of the top 500 open source projects in two major major ecosystems in the first step toward cataloging the critical software components on which much of the internet, applications, and device firmware rely. Open source software typically accounts for 70 to 90% of code in web and cloud applications. Application security firm Synopsys found that 98% of applications analyzed using its service included open source software, and 75% of the average code base comes from open source projects. The average software application relied on more than 500 open source dependencies, the company said. So the lists of common software components, dubbed the Census 2 of free and open source software application libraries, rank the top 500 packages from the JavaScript-focused Node Package Manager ecosystem and the top 500 components from non-NPM systems, including the Maven repository, the Python package index, and the .NET-focused NuGet package repository. In addition to public repository data, the census used telemetry from three software composition analysis firms to gain information on which software components are commonly used by companies in their application. The Census 2 project aims to find widespread open source projects that use outdated versions, popular components that are maintained by overworked developers, and common components that have slow vulnerability remediation times. The goal of the project is to give three groups more data on the usage of open source software. The first group, government agencies and open source security organizations, need the data to determine where to invest the funds that are being allocated by public initiatives, like the Biden administration's executive order on software security, and by private efforts like the OpenSSF. Meanwhile, companies need the information to determine which software components to use in their applications in the future. Finally, the top 500 lists can be a notification to open source project maintainers that their code affects far more users than they might have suspected. Okay, there's a new standard in town. This one's about multi-vendor CPU components. Everything old is new again. So imagine a laptop that uses a mixture of CPU cores from both, say, Intel and ARM, or a smartphone that has chip technologies from Qualcomm and Samsung on a single processor. That's what the new Universal Chiplet Interconnect Express specification is designed to do. This past Wednesday, a short list of uh, allied companies founded the whole thing. With That includes uh, AMD, Intel, ARM, TSMC, and Samsung, uh, among several others. Uh, they came out with uh, the new standard announcement. They describe it as an open 
chiplet ecosystem that can source chip designs and, and manufacturing throughout the industry. So this UCIE spec focuses on a standardized die-to-die -die interconnect, which uh, is supposed to be able to link the chip components together on a single processor. The companies have agreed to eventually, and I use that in air quotes, use, use the spec opening the door for their customers to mix and match uh, this wonderfully named chiplet thing um, from various vendors and pack them together for a single system on chip. So the concept of chiplets isn't new, although the word is, that particular word is kind of a marketing term. Uh, but the idea is simply to break down the various capabilities of an individual CPU into components so that manufacturers don't have to put everything on one die in response to every need. So if Intel has uh, two different GPU needs for the same CPU core, they don't have to build two, two or three or more separate dies. They can just use the core and then mix and match whatever GPU needs they want attached to it. And those could also be Intel GPUs or they could be GPUs from uh, somebody else. So just like when PCs moved from the single vendor hardware to multi-vendor component architecture, uh, UCIE's founding members believe that this, uh, this approach that uh, they're, they're touting is going to drive down costs through competition, but it's also going to cut manufacturing costs and improve overall chip yields. Intel has talked about something similar before, and, but it hasn't made it clear whether that's going to be rolled into UCIE or, or not, but uh, they have previously stated that they would combine uh, their silicon with that of TSMC, uh, which also makes AMD and Apple chips. And it's, uh, it has stated that it wants its new foundry business to supply hybrid architecture silicon that'll let customers use x86, ARM, or RISC-V tech all in a, in a single package. So uh, to promote the new standard, the founding members have created a consortium uh, and that'll, that's gonna uh, refine the whole interconnect specification over time. Uh, and what, but while all this sounds interesting, it's really just a white paper right now. Uh, and even some of these central protocols like form factor, management, security, none of that has really been fully defined. So even just getting to the state where new features could be implemented is going to take some time. And even once that's there, there are no rules as to when these vendors have fully committed to actually uh, deploying the spec in the real world. So uh, I wouldn't exactly call it smokeware, but uh, it's, it's, it's far from having a, a, a tangible future. Uh, but if you're looking for other information about it, some of the other companies that are involved include uh, Meta, of course, uh, Microsoft, Google Cloud, and Qualcomm, though weirdly, uh, NVIDIA's name didn't show up, which I found strange. That's it. Web applications continue to trend both in browser and hybrid frameworks like Electron, React Native, and other platforms out there. The organizations find it challenging and require specialized browser platform knowledge in order to maintain interoperability between the browsers. Now, it's a challenge when Apple app stores only let you like embed WebKit or JS runtime in the Mac and iOS applications. And in browsers, you need to support things like Chrome, Safari, and Firefox. Well, there may be a light at the end of the very long tunnel here. You know, it's almost as if a large piece of the underworld has started to freeze over, but we'll hear about this here. And Apple has started a partnership. That's right. They've partnered with Google, Microsoft, and Mozilla on a new endeavor to improve the interoperability and user experience of the web browser. That's right, of their web browser. Now, the group are working on a new benchmark dubbed Interop 2022, which will improve the experience of developing for the web in 15 key areas. Now, all four of the browser makers have agreed to focus on 15 areas, which will include cascade layers, color spaces, and CS color, CSS color functions, new viewport units, scrolling, and a lot more there in the list. Now, the project will focus on the four major browsers involved, Safari, Chrome Edge, and Firefox. Now, the end goal is to make web applications look and function similarly on different web browsers, which isn't the case currently. We all know that, especially if you're in web development. The goals are also all design focused, meaning that the browsers have an incentive to participate alongside their rivals. Now, I say this is a win for developers and organizations alike. Now, let's just see how long the tunnel is before we get to something that looks like interoperability. We'll see how long it takes. Well, folks, that does it for the blips. Next up, the bites. But before we get to the bites, we do have to thank a really great sponsor of this week at Enterprise Tech, and that's New Relic. Now, if you are a software engineer, you've definitely been there. I know I have. Mine was actually 12 a.m. on a Sunday, and I was at my neighbor's house for cards. Imagine it's 9 p.m. You're finally unwinding from home. Your phone buzzes. It's an alert. That's right. Something's broken, and your mind's already racing. What it could be? What could it be? Well, is it the back end, the front end? Is it global? Is it the server? Is it the network? Is it 
maybe the cloud provider? Do we have slower in queries? Did we introduce a bug on the latest deployment? I don't know. Now the whole team's scrambling from tool to tool and messaging person after person to find the right issue. According to a new Relic report, only half of all organizations are implementing observability for their networks and systems. Now, the report showed how maintaining network observability continues to be an issue for companies around the world. That won't happen if you get New Relic. Now, New Relic combines 16 different monitoring products that you'd normally buy separately. So engineering teams can see across their entire software stack in just one place. Now, you'll get a whole bunch of things. You'll get application monitoring, APM, unified monitoring for your apps and your microservices. You also get Kubernetes and Pixie with instant Kubernetes observability with Pixie. Distributed tracing, see all of your traces without management headaches so you can find and fix issues fast. Now, network performance monitoring as well. Stop guessing where performance issues start and ditch data silos for system-wide correlated view and so much more. More importantly, you can pinpoint issues down to the line of code so you know exactly why the problem happened and can resolve it quickly. That's why the DevOps teams at DoorDash, GitHub, Epic Games, and more than 14,000 other companies use New Relic to debug and improve their software. Whether you run a cloud-native startup or a Fortune 500 company, it takes just five minutes to set up New Relic in your environment. The next 9 p.m. call is just waiting to happen. Get New Relic before it does. And you can get access to the whole New Relic platform and 100 gigabytes of data free per month forever. No credit card required. Sign up at newrelic.com slash enterprise. That's N-E-W-R-E-L-I-C dot com slash enterprise. Newrelic.com slash enterprise. And we thank New Relic for their support of This Week and Enterprise Tech. Well, folks, it's now time for the news bites. Now, remote remote work has brought about numerous challenges for organizations. We know this. Not only has it, the network perimeter changed and there's a more security required at the edge, but there are more things to consider for securing data. Now, in the third year of the pandemic, organizations continue to adapt. We know this to the new norm of that distributed work through remote workforce. Now, they're doing things by standardizing their equipment remote for remote uh, employees, um, what they're also seeing is the IT departments are adjusting as well. In fact, due to data breaches and new technologies, some software is actually declining in use. This is the interesting part. We've heard more and more organizations use less VPNs and standalone antivirus programs. Meanwhile, emphasis on multi-factor MFA authentication and whitelisting is actually growing. This is interesting. Now, in a recent poll done by Dark Reading's 2022 Endpoint Security Survey, which polled about 190 cybersecurity and IT professionals on how pandemic-related changes affected their endpoint security strategies, the decline use of these technologies seemed to be a trend toward the growing integration of malware detection functions and other technologies, such as endpoint detection and response, EDR, uh, operating systems, and cloud technologies. Now, the 8% jump and requiring EDR software, in fact, from 35% in 2021 to 43% in 2022, supports the interpretation. Now, after EDR, the next highest rise requirements is for MFA. And we talk about this a lot. We actually rose from 7% from 51% in 2021 to 58% in 2022. That comes as Google and Microsoft began pushing MFA for their users. And it makes sense as the effective measure against account breaches, such as those in the Kaseya hack that we've heard out there. Now, this brings up some interesting topics about, you know, if I want to bring my, you know, my my own device to work, if I want to bring my own device onto my network. But I do want to bring my co-host back in because modern day work here requires more than just a turnkey solution, right? Organizations are using a combination of these technologies. I know I work with a lot of organizations out there. They use things like, for instance, uh, VPNs and uh, you know, concepts for like zero trust, like for instance, MFA to particular endpoints uh, that have data um, that they're constantly re-asking for uh, identity and um, whether the user is active or not. So I think it's interesting to see a dip in something like VPN. Curtis, I want to throw this to you. What are you seeing? What are you hearing? Is it, is it true that we, we're seeing a dip in VPN usage? I mean, I think that's a technology that was going to here to be here to stay, right? You know, it is, you would think, Lou, that you're right, that VPN would be a critical technology 
given the growth in the number of people coming in remotely. But in fact, there are a number of companies in the industry who are pushing what they call the end of VPN, where you do uh, user authentication uh, and identity verification, as well as encryption without requiring the dedicated tunnel pair that VPNs require. It's really an interesting thing where companies want and need the security of encrypted communications. They need the uh, user, authentic uh, user authentication and verification. But what they don't want is the resource heavy implementation that comes with VPNs. So I think that's what we're seeing. It's not that the companies are abandoning the requirement for encryption. It's that they're finding new ways to do it. And frankly, new ways that feed more directly into that zero trust architecture that more and more companies are adopting. This is interesting. Now, um, I want to this to you, uh, Oliver. You work with, you know, you talk with a lot of businesses out there, small, medium-sized businesses. And the concept of VPN, it's actually a, a cheaper alternative to some of the things that Curtis was actually talking about. Um, it does achieve the same thing. It's not necessarily very difficult to set up. And it can be combined with some of these other things like MFA and um, you know jump boxes and, and securing uh, tunnels and so on and so forth. Like, wh What are you seeing when you're talking to organizations? Okay. Are they moving more towards these other technologies or are they sticking with what, this is, what they got so far, right now? Uh the drop are 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 we also see a a lack of interest in VPNs, uh, especially starting Q4 last year into now. It's been like a very steep drop off. Uh, we we measure that by you know readership numbers on on those stories. So we've been yeah. asking questions. Uh, there's many factors actually contributing to this. It's kind of like a perfect storm. Um, in my humble opinion, I would say it's probably IT frustration. Uh, when it all started, VPNs were the golden remote work tool. You had to use them. Um, but now everybody followed pundits. And I'm sorry, I am a pundit. We all said, hey, move to cloud services. So all your apps should be cloud-based, right? But if all your apps are cloud-based from your word processor to your finance app to whatever, then users need what? A URL, a password, and maybe a uh, an MFA token generator, which would be their smartphone. At that point, they can use any device that that they want. They don't need a VPN and, and the device is, is is unmanaged. This makes, this makes obviously for an IT guy, that's a huge headache. Uh, they got very frustrated. We have this uh, organization called Spiceworks, which is big IT pro community. They did a, a whole bunch of surveys. That was one, probably the biggest IT complaint was just a complete inability to manage this slew of new hardware. People were using their own personal hardware, whether you wanted them to or not, because you couldn't verify it. And inadvertently, you gave them the, the tools to do it since there's really no, there's nothing tying them to the corporate notebook, which has the VPN client on it. So at that point, um, a lot of vendors for cloud services came out with uh, press releases saying, yeah, as long as you have H HTTPS and you've got, uh, you know, some kind of identity management services service up there for authentication, it's it's the same thing as having a, a VPN, which it really isn't. Um, but uh, the 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 perception came up that that maybe it it is, uh, and so a lot of IT guys I think just were throwing up their hands in frustration. They're trying to just get their arms around whatever they can, uh, and next along comes VPNs had some bad press. That was the next thing, and it's a completely different use case for VPNs. But I'm not sure my audience, which admittedly is not enterprise, it's a lower class audience. It's a it's a lower level of tech expertise audience. But when you see an article that says you know VPNs take some kind of hit as far as usage goes, or, you know, they, they quote fail. Uh, what that rule was really referring to was people who are using VPNs to hide what they're doing on the internet. And apparently some VPN services who claimed that they were no log services, turns out they were logging and turns out not only were they logging, they were willing to hand it over when the government asked, which freaked out a whole bunch of people who use, who were using VPNs for the purposes of hiding from big brother, not from protecting data. And there's a large chunk of my audience, which doesn't really, see the distinction, right? Even though, yes, maybe they aren't as good for hiding what you're doing from Big Brother anymore, uh, but they're still perfectly adequate for, for protecting data. Strong encryption is strong encryption. 
And then the last perfect storm is, I don't know about you guys, but my inbox has seen a number of press releases lately about DPNs, which is decentralized private networks, which are basically blockchain uh, right. encrypted networks. So it's, 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 it's uh, basically the, the Tor model. Nothing is uh, centralized, so it's an encrypted network. There's no place to take a log. There's no place to record anything. Everything's happening on shared uh, bandwidth, blah, blah, blah. And that's further confusing, uh, at least my segments, uh, somewhat as to what they should deploy now. So at least from the SMB side, there's a whole bunch of confusion around VPNs r right now, which I think is, is a big part of why they're, they're, taking, they're taking a hit. Sorry, that was long, you get, long winded. You, get, you guys bring up a lot of good points here. And I think um, one, one of the interesting thing, I think both you and Curtis are saying is, you know, a lot of organizations are trying to move towards um, better encryption. And I think one of the big ones is I've, I've seen organizations that we've in, in this report's actually calling it out that um, some organizations are saying no more unencrypted network traffic. That means that you have to have every layer of the network has to be encrypted in some way, some way, which actually can be very challenging because some of this, these standards and new technology out there have just come out. For instance, in you know, DNS, um, securing DNS, encrypted DNS. Curtis, what's going on here? Like, what are the challenges here to set this up? What are you seeing? Organizations require things like encrypted DNS and um, secure DNS. Well, there are, in fact, companies that have gone to uh, encrypted DNS. There are companies that are requiring, as you said, all network traffic be encrypted. That's a piece of the whole zero trust thing. The issue that is coming up is where you're doing the encryption. You know, there are now, you know, Google is offering encryption. Firefox is offering encryption. Uh, the various video services all have their encryption. The problem with this is that the need for encryption is running into the need to be able to decrypt traffic so that you can do deep packet inspection for security purposes. If you as the corporation are controlling all of the encryption. There are mechanisms to basically terminate the encryption at the point of packet inspection, do the packet inspection, re-encrypt going out. The problem, of course, is that each time you encrypt or decrypt, there's a performance hit. Uh, there is a, a resource requirement. And so we've got a lot of things playing, and we have to admit that the entire uh, pandemic work from home thing just blew this problem up in terms of the number of users being required to do this from um, outside the, the basic corporate network. The desire for this, the need for this isn't going away. The good news is that we're seeing a lot of creativity being applied to finding solutions that allow it to happen without really bumping up the resource requirement. So I'm looking forward over the next year or so to more and more solutions coming out. You know, we've talked about EDR, there's XDR, extended detection response, all going on at the endpoint and meeting the requirements for safe and secure communications. Fun times ahead. Uh, and the, the political situation in the world isn't dropping the requirement one little bit. We're going to see more about this. Indeed, indeed. I'll leave it at that. Fun times ahead, indeed. Well, folks, that does it for the bites. Next up, we have the guest to drop some knowledge on the Twilight Ride. But before we get to that, we do have to thank another great sponsor of This Week in Enterprise Tech, and that's Nareva. Hybrid work is here. That's right. It means people are going back to work, and meetings will have remote and on site workers participating. Complicated and costly. That's been the state of audio conferencing for large spaces for a long time. Now, choosing a traditional system might entail difficult design software and selecting from a dizzying array of separate mics, speakers, DSPs, and much more. Now, installation usually requires outside technicians is often highly invasive and very expensive. Now, it could take your room 
offline for days. Now, the industry was definitely primed for the same type of leap in technology that had transformed and simplified other sectors. Now, Nareva made that leap when they created revolutionary microphone mist technology. That's right. With this patented technology, one or two integrated microphone and speaker bars fill a room with thousands of virtual microphones. There are no dead zones and everyone can be heard everywhere in the room. Now, meeting in class, participants can simply talk and move naturally in the space and still be heard by remote participants. Thanks to continuous auto calibration, your rooms are instantly and always ready with optimized audio. No outside technicians required. Nareva also simplified installation. It's a 30-minute do-it-yourself job. That's it. That means big savings on time and cost compared to traditional systems. They simplified management too. That's right. Nareva console gives IT the power to monitor, manage, and adjust their systems from anywhere. No need for IT to go from room to room. So ask yourself if you want to go with the costly and complicated traditional system or make the leap to simple and economical with Nareva. Learn more at Nareva.com. That's N-U-R-E-V-A.com. And we thank Nareva for their support of this week in enterprise tech. Well, folks, it's my favorite part of the show. We actually get to bring in a guest to drop some knowledge on the Twyat Riot. And today we have Eric Arnold. He's CTO for Microsoft Philanthropies. Welcome to the show, Eric. Hi, everybody. Thanks. Honored to be here. Fantastic for having you. So, Eric, our audience loves to hear people's origin stories. Can you take us through a journey through tech and what brought you to Microsoft? Yeah, yeah, mine is uh, m- mine is a little uh, interesting. Um, so, if you go back far enough in my background, I'm actually a trained historian or or lapsed historian, as I describe it today. Um, so, I started in tech as tech was starting to uh, become more commonplace in in business and. Uh, started at the very bottom. Um, I started as a, uh, um, a technician in help desk and uh, working uh, technical support, worked my way through um, then into you know, rapid application development, uh, pairing into database engineering. Um, I'm a certified JDE database administrator, believe it or not, um, and then ultimately into uh, software engineering and, and software engineering management. Wow, fantastic! Now, what you know, when when you when you what kind of shifted you from software engineering management into the philanthropy side of things? Yeah, so I was I was working in leadership at an e-commerce company in the very early days of the cloud, and seeing um, what is now termed the digital divide first appear and start to widen, and leaving nonprofit organizations behind as the pace of technology change um, increased. And so I left the private sector and had an opportunity to join um, a global health nonprofit um, as their uh, CIO and helped take them through a series of digital transformations to look at how to improve both the, um, the enterprise technology inside the organization and then uh, how digital technology could be used um, in the field where the, the organization was working in the global south. Very interesting. Now, I, I come from the world of CRM I'm an XRM, so I'm very familiar with the common data model and CDS, and I still actually work mm-hmm. with that group now that I'm in the office group. So I, I definitely want to get into all this technology. But one interesting thing is Microsoft Microsoft Philanthropies here. Now, it's interesting at a, a social, human social level as well as a technology level. I'm just curious, maybe you can take us through a little bit of what they are doing. Yeah, absolutely. So at Microsoft, we are um, very quietly um, one of the largest corporate philanthropies out there and have over a 40 year history of philanthropic giving and and philanthropy really is in the DNA of the company and a lot of the employees. And and you you see that every day, um, particularly through through times where we're living through through crisis like we are now. And as um, the um, the world was shifting from on-prem software to cloud software. It's it's very inexpensive. It's very easy easy to give shrink wrap software, but there's true cost behind the cloud. And so, as we were looking at how we, as a company, wanted to do more, wanted to tap that philanthropic spirit that we have, wanted to empower every person and every organization on the planet to do more, to empower every nonprofit and humanitarian organization to accelerate social good, we needed to create 
a business model around that that allowed us to invest more in purpose-built technology specifically tuned for nonprofit workflows to combine that with um, uh, with a partner ecosystem where we were activating Microsoft's, you know, hundreds of thousands of partners around the world um, with services around capacity building that allowed nonprofits to adopt technology faster. And to do that, we created a new organization inside Philanthropies in 2017 called Tech for Social Impact. And what this is, is it represents a business model that allows us to invest in these areas with a social reinvestment model that we combine all of our grants and uh, donations and very inexpensive software provided to the nonprofit sector together with um, technology investments that we make that allow us then to reinvest anything that we make in working with nonprofit back in, into all of our social good initiatives. And in this way, we've been able to really expand um, the, the work that Microsoft's been able to do um, around the world. And so when we started this, Microsoft worked with about 70,000 nonprofits globally. Our CEO said that um, we aspired to donate a billion dollars in software cash and services over the next three years from 2017 to 2020. Well, today, because of this, this business model, we donate um, uh, just under $3 billion every year to 225,000 nonprofits globally, and that's continuing to grow. It's been a, a very successful model for us um, and a, a great beacon for, for other private, sec uh, private sector technology companies. Now, I think one of the big important things I'm hearing here is obviously a lot of the partnerships that you're having um, and, and the fact that you're actually seeing growth and, and collaboration amongst many different tech companies. Um, what does this bring to, you talked a little bit about how this is bringing to back to technology. Where, where are you seeing the technology going? What, what is, is starting to show up as like, is it, is it open source technology? What kind of technology are we seeing here to help to help these organizations? Yeah, there is a lot of open source and traditionally open source is, is a big part of um, how nonprofits experience modern technology. And there is a lot more investment from private sector te technology companies like Microsoft to create um, a, a market that allows for successful innovation from you know, large enterprise companies like us all the way down to, to very small startups that are working in um, focused on, on social initiatives. And so the, the thing that's important for me um, and one of the, the big uh, gap areas when I was actually working in the sector was a lack of standards and a lack of uh, collaboration across technology platforms. And so we made it a mission to um, leverage the, the common data model structure at Microsoft to create a common data model for nonprofit, treating nonprofit as an industry. How can we work together with the, the experts uh, in nonprofit coming directly from nonprofits that are you know, small local organizations operating in communities, doing health and human services and community impact work, all the way up to international humanitarian aid organizations, uh, funding organizations, private foundations, and international um, uh, uh, governmental funders to come together and define what are the best practices, what are some of the common scenarios that every nonprofit faces, and how can we then build standards on top of that and represent those best practices and standards in a schema um, and create the, the entities and uh, attribution and, and entity relationships that represent that, publish that as an open source standard without dependencies on the Microsoft technology, and then as Microsoft be the first best customer of that to build first party tech and light up our partner ecosystem to make it easier for them to build innovative technology on top of it. Now profit, the, the margins are hard. You know, these are often organizations that are chronically underfunded and underserved by the technology sector. And so we felt if we put some effort into creating a baseline technology that helped reinforce the, those standards, it would become less expensive, less R&D on the part of partners to then uh, take that technology and deliver it out um, to nonprofits all around the world. It's very interesting because I think that, you know, what we're seeing, obviously, this common data model, this ability to kind of open source that data model, and then also be able to, to host it on some of the platforms and services at Microsoft. Now, are you seeing an adoption of this model in other parts, other providers and cloud providers and service oriented uh, architectures out there? Or are you, is it kind of a slow adoption phase? 
Yeah, that, that's that been really encouraging. And so there are other uh, platform providers that have um, either aligned to the data model and, and created uh, connectors. So you can think of the data model almost as a Rosetta Stone in, in, in that example that allows a nonprofit to pick best of breed applications that work for their specific scenarios and have the data in those platforms then be uh, much more easily aggregated into a, um, in, a system of, of intelligence that then they can take informed action against. We also have per, uh, uh, partners uh, on other platforms and Microsoft partners that are taking that common data model and using it to uh, inform or change their architecture in their products. And there we have like true interoperability between application sets and across platforms. And that's something that, that's been you know, really, truly exciting for me. And unlike other industries, I think in the nonprofit sector, you have a lot of willingness for um, technology corporations that may otherwise compete to really come together and collaborate to drive uh, solutions for, for organizations. What's the progression of, it, of this becoming more standard? I know you talked about it becoming standard or standardized. Is it still in progress? Has it already been standardized? Can organizations already take advantage of it? Yeah, we first published uh, the Common Data Model in 2018. We've done um, a number of revisions on it. We have a steering team that is made up of um, uh, key people from around around the sector. And it's a really key question you ask, because one of the, the places that we are right now, we don't think of it as a Microsoft Common Data Model for a nonprofit. We think of it as a, you know, this is truly something that's owned by the sector. Right. And so how do we get from where we are right now, where Microsoft is stewarding it, if you will, to where it's it's truly governed and and looking at at you know maybe a, a Linux based model where we bring together other technology partners we bring together um, other influencers to form a governance council around it um, to drive additional adoption how do we take the common data model and drive it into some non traditional areas like some of the collaborations that are forming that are are looking to drive digital public goods and emerging markets for example through some of the UN activities so there's different areas where where we're you know, we're absolutely open to and um, actively working with um, different kinds of partners to find the right governance model for how we graduate this and continue driving it at a, as a standard. Fantastic. Well, lots more to talk about here. I do want to bring my co-host back in after the break. But before we do, we do have to make another great sponsor of This Week at Enterprise Tech, and that's PlexTrack. PlexTrack, the premier cybersecurity reporting and workflow management platform that empowers teams to win the right security battles. What if you could streamline the communication across the entire security department so that every team member could do their job more efficiently? I feel like it sounds, sounds good, right? Well, from simplified data aggregation and reporting to integrated ticketing for remediation to analytics and visualizations for board reporting, PlexTrack touches every aspect of the security management workflow. Gain a real-time view of your security posture by bringing all your data sources together into one powerful platform where you can triage scanner results, generate powerful analytics and visualizations, assign remediation tasks, attest to your posture, and track progress over time. As a satisfied PlexTrack client put it, we see PlexTrack as a part of our strategy to move quicker and be proactive. Now we have real-time view of what we need to focus on, and I have an easy way of showing senior leadership. PlexTrack serves every aspect of the enterprise security team program with features designed to improve workflow, collaboration, and communication for each role, including red team data aggregation. In fact, you can import data from all of your automated vulnerability scanners and tools, triage and report results in half the time. Blue team remediation, you can assign remediation tasks right on the platform or through simple integrations with the ticketing tools your team already uses and track progress over time. In fact, you have stakeholder communication used powerfully at Simple Analytics to attest to security posture and prioritize issues, tailor attestation and communication to the needs of both team members and your C-suite. Continuous purple teaming assessment. Begin purple teaming or power up your current strategies with Runbooks, the best in industry tool for test plan execution. PlexTrack improves the entire security engagement lifecycle by making it easy to generate security reports, deliver them securely, and track the issues to completion straight from the platform. Book a demo 
today. Try PlexTrack free for one month and see how it can change your life as a security professional. Simply go to PlexTrack.com slash twit and claim your free month. That's P-L-E-X-T-R-A-C.com slash T-W-I-T. And we thank PlexTrack for their support of This Week and Enterprise Tech. Well, folks, we've been talking with Eric Arnold. He's CTO for Microsoft Philanthropies. We talk a lot about just how you know there's a lot of things going on in this area and how Microsoft is driving some of these efforts, and you know, especially around data and data standards. Uh, but I do want to bring my co-host back in because they have some questions and they've been chomping at the bit here behind the scenes. Uh, I want to go to Oliver first. Oliver, yeah, I got uh, two questions. One might be stupid. Um, in going through this, the the the, micro, the Microsoft nonprofit accelerator is that under TSI or is that TSI adjacent? That is under TSI, and so what we have created at Microsoft is an engineering team within Microsoft Philanthropies, and so um, we actually have product that Philanthropies is producing. We work um, in collaboration with all of Microsoft's uh, core product teams, but mm-hmm. we're the the product team that is driving that. Gotcha. So I did notice in researching that it got updated, what, six times between middle 2019 to end of December 2020, and then it stopped. Uh, is it is it complete or did COVID knock you guys offline or what happened? No, no. That, so, so the evolution there is, you know, going back to that common data model again. So, you know, as we thought about, you know, what is the, what are the ways that that enterprise technology can help nonprofit um, accomplish mission, you know, be more, more effective in mission, more efficient in operation. Common data model was, was a big part of that as sexy and wonderful as it is to talk about a data schema. Um, it's really abstract until you, you actually get some workflow on top of it and talk about it. So the accelerator was really, targeted at bringing the common data model to life. And it it was really targeted at partners to help partners understand what the concepts were behind the, the data model itself. What we found in practice was that because of some of the the realities of working um, in the nonprofit industry, partners were still shy about making the investments to take the the common data model and turn that into finished technology. And that's when Microsoft made the decision that we're going to create our own first party product to a point that um, we help take some of that that cost out of the equation for other technology partners to leverage um, the the tech and the model. And so that's where we. Uh, changed from an accelerator strategy to a product strategy. And we published um, our first Microsoft Cloud for nonprofit applications then starting in 2020. Gotcha. Gotcha. So one, the other question is kind of an amalgam of several questions rolled up into one, but there is one general point. Uh, My readers, and I'm sure the viewers on this show, when they see something like this, they generally want to know how they can get involved. Uh, and mm-hmm. so that's one, how can they, yeah, sure. How can they get involved with you? That's a, but B, how can they get involved, uh, on a technology level, supplying technology that isn't part of your framework? I'm sure your solution while fantastic mm-hmm. is probably yep. not giving non nonprofits every technique that they, that they want. So what right. else, uh, what, what are the other needs out there and how would they go about, uh, getting in into the fray? Yeah, sure. Like like any any schema, it's an abstraction, um, and uh, the abstra- abstraction do- doesn't apply in, in every use case. And uh, every organization out there has has specific needs. So while you know we think we we have a great starting point and think our goal of you know helping reinforce best practices um, helps create standardization, which helps you know make it easier to to, to innovate. Um, so. There are a lot of different organizations that that engage in helping nonprofit organizations take on technology. And I would say, you know, wherever you are in, in whatever capacity you're doing technology today, your organization or your community has um, connections to nonprofits that are uh, guarantee you trying to use um, technology in better ways to to be more efficient in how they're operating and and to get better at how they're delivering their services and measuring their services and really understanding the impact of their work. And that can be through anything from 
you know, in, in a community working with organizations that are serving homeless populations or, or the, the mentally ill um, in health and human services scenarios to um, some of the humanitarian crises that, that we see right now and some, you know, of the larger humanitarian organizations that are responding to what's happening in Eastern Europe or the climate crisis and climate refugees. There, there's an awful lot going on right now. And if you reach out to your local organizations or, or local chapters, in nonprofits, um, they have volunteer opportunities. They constantly need skilled volunteers to work with them. And uh, through the organizations, the companies that that any listeners are uh, working with, um, if they have a corporate social responsibility program, they likely have connections with um, nonprofit organizations that are looking to um, engage with with technology staff beyond pure volunteering. Um, work that that Microsoft, that other organizations are doing, we're, we're trying to pull together to create more innovative technology. Um, you look at you know some of the really encouraging signs that I've seen, like a, um, a group of organizations in the Bay Area have come together um, uh, called Impact Cloud, that's um, Box and Twilio and um, uh, Salesforce and, and about a dozen others um, there are uh, organizations like TechSoup that are serving the smallest nonprofits and trying to um, help their access to, to technology. There are a lot of startups that, that are uh, beginning that have a um, social mission or, or are driving um, social good technology. And so different ways to get engaged in that. What, one of the things that we're trying to do in Microsoft is to encourage citizen developers and encourage contribution to solutions and have an innovation hub on GitHub um, that you can get involved with where we publish the results of hackathons. We publish some of our, our partner technology, some of our own solutions in open source that people can pick up those solutions and, and carry them forward, contribute um, projects to them uh, and uh, engage in that way as well. Sweet. Excellent. Thank you. Thanks, Oliver. Well, I do want to bring uh, Curtis back in as well. Curtis. Thank you, Lou. Uh, one of the questions I had, you know, when you talk about Microsoft innovation and innovation in general, so much of it is over communications and communicating between uh, an organization and donors or the people it serves, whatever. But one of the things that this pandemic has pointed out with great effectiveness is that broadband, high level communication capability is not at all evenly distributed. And so one of the questions I have is how challenging do you find it working with organizations to help them overcome what may be a lack of this basic, you know, internet communication capabilities between themselves and, you know, either the population they're trying to serve or the population that they need to reach in order to communicate with uh, vendors, donors, and partners. Yeah, it, it, it's a great point. And there's, um, it is very uneven and it depends on, on where you talk. Um, in, in developed um, economies like in North America, um, even um, many people that are um, considered vulnerable populations and beneficiaries of some of these services still have access to mobile. And you can have a, a mobile first mentality in terms of helping um, individual beneficiaries on, um, have the information they need to get the services that ne they need to help them in whatever situation they're in. Um, in other regions, not so much, but there are some encouraging signs. In the, the latest ITU data, about 75% of the world's population does have some access to a broadband connection. Over the last 10 years, we've seen about a 600% increase in availability of broadband in Africa. And while it's uneven distributed, the, the major population centers, um, even in um, the global south, have access to reliable internet connectivity. And so with a, a mobile first mentality, with um, uh, some understanding of how you can work a model where you're working kind of a hub and spoke model between an urban center in, in a region like Ni Nairobi, where you have connectivity working in rural regions, say in, in uh, uh, Western Kenya, 
through mobile devices, you can create solutions and patterns that that help um, uh, the people that are operating there have access to more real time data and get faster feedback so that they can they can tune the services better. And so while while I don't think it's been at all solved, um, I have seen some some improvement over the last uh, five to ten years in in the access um, uh, to digital technology and specifically to cloud based technology. And so I'm I'm of a mentality right now that that I'm not betting against the network, but we do need to responsibly design solutions that are tolerant in um, occasionally connected network environments and in some cases are able to work offline through containers on, on mobile devices. Um, so I think one other question, I think we've, we've had a lot of audience members um, in our chat room and they're 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 curious about um, you know, what is an entry point for an organization? Uh, they're talking about uh, TechSoup being an entry point for access to software and services. What's a great entry point for a small organization, especially nonprofit? Yeah, so for for any nonprofit that wants to, to get started um, with any of the offers that we have available for, for Microsoft, it, um, go to microsoft.com, WAC Nonprofits. Um, from there, there is a uh, get started page that allows you to register. Um, once you register, then you're, you're, uh, you have access to all of our software grants, all the services that we provide, and all of the, the nonprofit discounts that we provide. And so the way we think about it, um, there are millions of nonprofits profits all around the world that, that qualify for this. And we want to reach as many of them as possible. And um, we can't say it enough um, in terms of you know get, getting the word out and, and helping organizations understand how to navigate the process and get access uh, to, to this technology. The, um, the, um, the next step from there, so you go through, a, um, once you submit on Get Started, um, then once you're validated, you have access to the offers and we will connect you either directly with Microsoft or with one of our global partners, depending on where you're located. Fantastic. Well, folks, unfortunately, all good things must come to an end. Thank you, Eric, so much for being here. I really do appreciate being here. Before we close up, I know you covered a little bit about how people can get started and where people can go, but maybe tell them a little bit about um, where they can get started and understand the common data model and how they can maybe un you know, understand whether their organization can jump on that bandwagon as well. Yeah, so we have um, the Nonprofit Common Data Models published out on GitHub. And so you can uh, look up Nonprofit Common Data Model and get into uh, that uh, that project and uh, um, crawl the schema to your heart's content. There's there's 350 pages of, of documentation and examples and um, uh, connections to the team uh, for when you have uh, any questions or, or suggestions for us. Thanks again. Well, folks, you've done it again. You sat through another hour of the best dang enterprise podcast in the universe. So definitely tune your podcast here to Twyat. I want to thank everyone who makes this show possible, especially to my co-host. So I'm going to have the very own Mr. Oliver Rist. Oliver, what's going on for you in the coming weeks? Where can people find you? Oh, hmm. uh, you can still find me there on, on PCMag.com. Uh personally authored works. I don't really foresee anything in the near future, but like I said last time, we are still working uh, up to our eyeballs in VoIP services. So when that, uh, when that effort bears fruition, I will let you know. Fantastic. Thanks, Oliver. Well, we also have to thank our very own Mr. Curtis Franklin. Curtis, you're a very busy guy. What, what's going on for you in the coming weeks? Where can people find you? Well, lots of research on cybersecurity awareness training, lots of uh, work trying to figure out the uh, enterprise security management implications of the current geopolitical uh, situation. You can always find me at Dark Reading. I'll point to that on a combination of Twitter and LinkedIn. Follow me in both of those places. Would love to know what the Twyat Riot thinks about cybersecurity. Thank you, Curtis. Well, folks, we also have to thank you as well. You're the person who drops in each and every week to get your enterprise and IT goodness. We want to make it easy for you to get your enterprise news, your IT news. So go to our show page right now, twit.tv 
slash twyatt there you'll find all of our amazing back episodes the show notes the co-host information the guest information of course the links that we do during the show as well but more importantly next to those videos you'll get those helpful subscribe and download links that's right support the show by getting your audio version your video version of your choice and listen on any one of your podcast applications or any one of your devices because we're on all of them so definitely check it out and subscribe it's the best way to support the show now you may have heard there's also club Twit as well. That's right. It's a members only ad free podcast service with a bonus Twit Plus feed that you can't get anywhere else. And it's only $7 a month. That's right. Now, one of my favorite things is of Club Quit is also that exclusive access to the members only Discord channel. Some really fun and interesting conversations out there. Some great channels. People are amazing at the animated GIF out there. So definitely check it out and be part of that. Join Club Twit and be part of this movement. Go to twit.tv slash Club Twit. Now, Club Twit also offers corporate group plans as well. That's why it's a great way to give your team access to our ad-free tech podcast. The plans start with five members at a discounted rate of just $6 each per month, and you get had as many seats as you like. That's right. This is a great way for your IT department, your developers, your tech teams to stay up to date with access to all of our podcasts. And just like regular memberships, they can join the Twit Discord server and get the Twit Plus bonus feed as well. That's twit.tv slash club twit. Now, after you subscribe, you can impress your family members, your coworkers, your friends with the gift of Twyatt. We talk about a fun, a lot of fun tech topics on this show, a lot of great subjects. And I can guarantee they will find it fun and interesting as well. So definitely share it with them and have them subscribe. Now, if you've already subscribed and you're available on Fridays, 1.30 p.m. Pacific time, we do this show live. That's right, live.twit.tv. You can check it out right now. We have a lot of streams there. Come see how the pizza is made. Come see, see all the banter behind the scenes. Come see us make mistakes. Uh, come see us have fun. Now, if you're going to watch the show live, you might as well jump into our live chat room as well. We have the infamous IRC channel, irc.twit.tv. Go there right now in your browser. You can use your fa- your famous, your, your, your normal IRC client as well at irc.twit.tv. Um, we have a lot of great characters in there uh, at the uh, Twit Live channel. Uh, they're there every week. They give us some great content and some great discussions. And I got some great questions from them. And of course, the show titles as well. We get that from them as well. So definitely check that out at irc.twit.tv. Definitely hit me up at twitter.com slash loumm. There I post all my enterprise tidbits. You can direct message me for show ideas, content. I have great discussions each and every week with people. I talk about a whole bunch of ton fun tech topics on there. As well as you, if you want to see what I do at my normal work week at Microsoft, go to developers.microsoft.com slash office. There we post the latest and greatest ways you can customize your office experience for yourself and your organization by using things like JavaScript, TypeScript, C Sharp, whatever you want to use, whatever technology you want to use, we have a API or a platform for you. So definitely check it out and be part of that as well. I want to thank everyone who makes this show possible, especially to Leo and Lisa. They continue to support This Week in Enterprise Tech each and every week. And we couldn't do the show without them. So thank you to all their support. I want to also thank all the engineers and staff at Twit and also thank Mr. Brian Chi, Chibert. He's not only our co host, but he is also our tireless producer as well. He does all the show bookings and the plannings for the show, and we couldn't do it without him. So thanks again, Chibert, for all your support. Of course, before we sign out, we have to thank our editor today, Mr. Anthony. He is an amazing guy. He does all, he makes us look good after the fact. Plus our TD for today, Mr. Burke. Burke, it's great to have you back on the show. How's everything going over there at Twit? It's going well. Are you keeping me really busy, uh, TD, in the show? I'll tell you, especially that doc. It's a masterpiece. <laughs> I bet. I bet it is a masterpiece. You're right. Sometimes I, I get lost. So maybe it's not such a great masterpiece. But we'll have to we'll have to look at it. Thanks, Burke, for being here. And, oh, and, 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 that, wanna... and that makes it look easy. I'll, I'll just put it that. <laughs> so we do. Everybody, everybody does such a great job. They make it look easy. Thanks, Burke. Well, until next time, I'm Louis Moresca. Just reminding you, if you want to know what's going on in the enterprise, just keep quiet. Don't miss all about Android every week. We talk about the latest news, hardware, apps, and now all the developer goodness happening in the Android ecosystem. I'm Jason Howell, also joined by Ron Richards, Florence Ion, and our newest co-host on the panel, Wen Tu Dao, who brings her developer chops. Really great stuff. We also invite people from all over the Android ecosystem to talk about this mobile platform we love so much. Join us every Tuesday, all about Android on twit.tv.